So today, uh, you may remember, we're talking about all the light in the universe, most of right. which is invisible. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about the visible light, the okay. visible spectrum. The visible spectrum, and what is that? Well, it's electromagnetic radiation like x-rays and gamma rays that we talked about before. And UV. And UV and infrared and microwaves and radio waves, all of these things. But this is the part uh, that is actually visible to, to our, our retina. In fact, when it's a wavelength that, that when they impact our retina, they are transformed into visual information. And, and it's, it's right in the middle of the spectrum. It's right in the fact. middle. Mm. The wavelengths, in fact, are somewhere between 380 nanometers and 740 nanometers. So that's tiny. They're pretty short, yeah. 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 Uh -huh. yeah. A nanometer meaning a tiny, tiny little bit of a meter. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you may remember the very first talk, uh, uh, if, um, if, you, if you saw our very first talk, we talked about uh, Isaac Newton, and we talked about how he spit white light into its constituent colours, and those uh, colours uh, would represent that whole uh, range of uh, that Anne just spoke about, um, uh, uh, the, the range that's visible to our eyes. Um, and he went on then to, uh, to write a treatise. On, that's on right. And Isaac Newton um, described his understanding of light mm. based on his experiments uh, in a document called Optics in 1672, Optics with a K. Mm -hmm. um, and that really became the basis for understanding light for everybody in the scientific world mm -hmm. for, for a century at least and more so. than a century yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. but more than a hundred years later um uh johann wolfgang von goethe um mm. uh, so he wasn't really a scientist he was a universal man wasn't he really a really writer was, a philosopher yeah. a mathematician right. a uh, politician as mm -hmm. well and mm -hmm. a painter a, a talented mm -hmm. painter mm -hmm. he was a, a sort of universal man really mm -hmm. and he um uh, was really interested in colour mm -hmm. and uh, he's, he did a lot of studies of colour, a lot of experiments in colour himself and he wrote his own theory of colour in 1810 which really disputes the Newtonian concept of, of, of colour. Um, uh, uh, which was Newtonian concept was colour is pure physics whereas his, 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 right, was, yeah. his was about perception really, It was wasn't about it? perception, yeah. 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 He started to observe, observe. Um, at the time uh, people were were um, designing colour wheels to try and lay down the relationships between a lot of colours mm -hmm. and um, the Newtonian earlier ones essentially later have been really quite diagrammatic they divided mm -hmm. colours up into quite strict uh, strict zones that were with, with sharp edges mm -hmm. and uh, Goethe himself designed a new colour wheel and it was a very subtle colour wheel you can see it if you look at this you see how there's like a lot of sensitive gradations and, and, and evolutions it gently gently really develops mm. from one colour right around and back to itself. I think this is subtractive colour, which is painted colour. Uh -huh, so uh, I think that would be the implied, so where, where the three triangles are superimposed, the blue, the red and the yellow, uh, they make black. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. and of course, blue, red, and yellow are painters' primaries. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. And um, he was really looking at it from a more, um, you know, per perceptive point of view because mm. he considered that that colour. He observed really that colour was not just um, objective, but it was related to a lot of other phenomena. Mm -hmm. So, so if you had one colour beside another colour, then that would change the perception of that colour. Or if you colour in the dark or colour brightly lit, that would also change the way you saw the colour. Right. So there was a conversation so, going on at that stage about about what colour might be. Um, and, and, and that conversation continues to this day, doesn't it really? In fact, I mean, when we look at, at our theory of colour now, we still talk about it in terms of, uh, uh -huh. in terms of colour wheels. And it, that's right, yeah, that's right. Yeah. McKeogh designed to find his own colour space, which is actually very relatively simple, isn't it? Except mm. it's in three, dimension, three dimensions as opposed mm. to two dimensions. Yeah, which still wouldn't yeah. make sense in terms of Newtonian physics, because Newtonian physics was a linear, uh, the spectrum was a linear thing. It wouldn't have mm -hmm. turned back in itself. So explain here, how, how does McKeogh transform the two-dimensional colour wheel of, of uh, Newton and Goethe into this three-dimensional diagram. Colour space, yeah. Well, for, so this would be really the, the contemporary theory of how the eye works. Uh, so it works by oppositions, oppositions of blue and yellow, which as you know would be complementary colours, green and red, and black and white. Uh, and, uh, and it seems that the optic nerve, not so much as not so much the retina as the optic nerve works by sending signals of these oppositions of 
blue, yellow, red, green, black, white. Okay, that's mm. really, really interesting. So we're talking mm. about color complementaries. We're mm. talking mm. about because, um, um, uh, Johann Wolfgang uh, Goethe. <laughs> <laughs> so he published his own theory of colors in 1810. Mm. And this disputes the New Newtonian uh, notion of, of color as being a measurable phenomena. Mm -hmm. um, and so he said in, in this, he, he wrote, along with the rest of the world, I was convinced that all colors are contained in the light. No one had ever told me anything different and I've never found the least cause to doubt it because I had no further interest in the subject. But how I was astonished as I looked at a white wall through the prism that it stayed white. That only where it came upon some darkened area it showed some colour. Then at last around the windowsill all the colours shone. It didn't take too long before I knew that here there was something significant about colour to be brought forth. And I spoke as through an instinct out loud that the Newtonian teachings were false. Mm. Now, I don't think he's quite right that they were false. Mm. I, think, I think Newton, a lot of his teachings or his deductions were correct. Mm. But he didn't uh, understand that notion of, of comparative. Of contextuality. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because when you look at the thing from a contemporary point of view, um, this is a very famous, uh, uh, famous um, optical illusion that's, uh, that, that we've seen often. The chessboard with the shadow over it mm -hmm. and uh, the square A and the square B. Uh, the square B appears to be white, the square A appears to be dark grey, but in fact they're the same colour. Uh, and, uh, and this is a... Do that this, again? This so square A and square B, uh, okay, uh, so it's, square cl it's clearly, B clearly A looks darker works. than A. Yeah, yeah. A, B looks almost white, white in a mm -hmm. slight shadow, mm -hmm. but there's only really lighter. Oh, and then, well, when yeah. you, then you discover yeah. they're the same colour. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. So your eyes uh, really base their uh, judgment of colour on context. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, even back then, I mean, people were really, you know, concerned or they were aware that colour, there was an emotional or psychological aspect to colour. Mm. And, and Goethe at the time, uh, he, he had even designed what he called the Rose of Temperaments, which is a colour wheel um, that illustrated human occupations and character traits. And so, so he had, you know, different colours, including, you know, to, to represent people, including tyrants, heroes, adventurers, hedonists, lovers, poets, public speakers, philosophers, teachers, etc. Mm -hmm. Grouped into four temper, temperaments, or types of temperaments, related to colour. Right. So this would have represented a kind of opposition to the purely physical notion of colour of Newton, That's a psychological, right. a psychological, psychological notion. aspect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, yeah. then um, he, had, he had a student called Arthur Schopenhauer, um, mm. who uh, he met actually, um, Schopenhauer's mother uh, had a salon. Oh yes. He met him yeah. at the salon, he met Goethe at the salon, mm -hmm. Goethe was much older, and um, Schopenhauer learned a lot from Goethe, but then uh, he, he, their, their perception of colour diverged mm. and they fell out actually. Mm. He wrote his own, um, his own theory of colour called On Vision and Colours Shopping in, 18, yeah. in yeah. 1816. Yeah. So only six years actually mm. after Goethe mm. published his. But he was very much a younger man and he, he began as a student. Yeah, and then yeah. He, yeah, yeah. Because Schopenhauer at the time maintained that, that the eye was active. In fact, he said uh, the eye's reaction to external stimulus is an activity, not a passive response. Mm -hmm. So that would very that very much uh, would, uh, would connect up with contemporary theories of perception. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you, you look at the, the, a lot of the, 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 the work that we've done with scientists and we, in the last 10 years we've been mm -hmm. working with researchers in, into perceptive psychology uh, quite regularly. Um, we're going to look at one of them now. We're going to talk to one of them now. Um, uh, you look at somebody like Richard Gregory's Eye and Brain, and essentially they're working on uh, the eye as something that's part of the brain, really. And then beyond that, uh, uh, they're working on the idea that the eye is a constant conversation between the brain and the world. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, so it sounds very much yeah. like Schopenhauer. But Schopenhauer wasn't quite there because mm. he himself thought the eye was the active organ, or at mm -hmm. least that's what he seemed to suggest. And I mean, they wouldn't I, have had, uh, I mean, now we have much more of an idea of just how much of the brain is taken up with, with uh, dealing with the information mm. coming from the eye and mm. dealing with giving commands to the eye. And, uh, oh, and, uh, right. and it seems like it's about a third of the, 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 the brain, which is an enormous space. Um, uh, we, we have the privilege of, uh, of having an ongoing conversation with a perceptive psychologist called 
Kevin O'Regan, yeah. and he's, uh, he's spoken to us about this recently. Um, uh, we're just going to show you quickly what he had to say. When you look at a visual scene, most people think that what's happening is that you're creating this internal picture. Mm -hmm. And um, my theory about vision, which is uh, uh, developed from mm, uh, my studies of eye movements, uh, uh, suggests that it's not an internal picture that you generate. It's what I should say, internal knowledge. And that, but the knowledge is not like a picture. The knowledge is knowledge about what is in the scene. Uh, and it's more of, in an abstract form. So if you look at a scene, what you see, or what your brain essentially gathers from looking at the scene, is not what, uh, what, what a cameraman would call pixels. Mm -hmm. It's not like a photograph. It's, it's knowledge. It's stuff like, well, the couch is red, and it is to the left, and it is in the lower part of the scene, and behind it there is this. So it's a, it's a description rather than being a picture. Mm -hmm. And but the thing is that the brain is very limited in its memory and limited in its attention. So when you look at a particular scene visually because there's all this, this stuff coming in you have the impression there's lots of stuff there but actually you really only register a semantic abstract description of the scene and and because your brain is very limited your attention span is very limited that description is also very limited so your impression that you see the world in in, in fantastic detail is, 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 is an illusion. Exactly. Your impression of, uh, of seeing a rich visual field derives from the fact that if anything should change, you would immediately be, uh, be, uh, become aware of it because it attracts your attention. But that doesn't mean that you have internally stored everything that's in there. In fact, in fact th this idea uh, uh, could be summed up by saying that there's no need for you to make an internal picture of your outside world because the outside world can be referred to as though it was an external memory. You know, if you want to know anything about the world, well, just turn your eyes towards it and you can, you can, you can get it. Why bother to make an internal picture? Uh, the world as an external memory uh, that your brain accesses constantly through your eyes uh, or that your brain has the constant possibility of access to through your eyes. That's a fascinating idea for artists. Incredible yeah, idea. Yeah, and, yeah, and, for, yeah. and philosophers and, mm. and, and scientists, I think, and, mm -hmm. and anybody who, who thinks about these things. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the idea that really you don't form any sort of internal picture of the world. Uh, that's an illusion. Uh, because it's all there. Mm. It's all there around you. So, mm -hmm. so you can just quite simply refer to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. So um, a colleague uh, we'd like to turn now to um, to look at a project that we've done with a colleague of mm -hmm. Kevin's. Uh, his name is Patrick Kavanagh. He, nothing to the poet Patrick Kavanagh. Uh, the researcher, the Canadian researcher Patrick Kavanagh, who came from Harvard School of Psychology to Paris Descartes, uh, the laboratory where which which Kevin was directing, and uh, we we did very recently. Um, did a project with uh, with Patrick in the Tate Modern. I think art is really visual experiments, I and mean, artists are exploring different ways to present uh, scenes or ideas, and they come up with uh, insights and discoveries that are very important for vision science. So we've, we've done a lot of uh, studying of what artists have discovered over the centuries and millennia, and there's just some wonderful insights into what shadows are and what reflection is and things that are hard to understand in the brain that artists have understood intuitively how to capture these properties in the visual world. And uh, so there's some things that artists understand and that the brain understands, but the scientists don't understand yet. So we do study artists, we see how they know what they know, and study art as a sort of discovery of science. So are you trying to reverse engineer what the artists are doing? <laughs> Absolutely, yes, yes, it's really here. 
Uh, some artists uh, know exactly what they're up to, like Dennis <laughs> and maybe James Terrell. Uh, sure. they, uh, I'd include us <laughs> James Terrell. <laughs> and they, uh, they really um, explore perception and then make it part of their art. Other artists just fall upon things and are amazed at it, and then we are as well, trying to, as you say, reserve the reverse engineer. And for the artist, uh, is this a new repertoire of phenomena or, or, or visual uh, enhancement that you can go for? I mean, you're always trying to give people something visually new and intriguing. Yeah. Does yeah. the science yeah. help? Yeah, I mean, for example, what we're showing here is the equiluminance helmet, or what we call the equiluminance helmet. And that's based on something that Patrick's been, been uh, exploring for about 30 years now. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but for us, it was totally new, um, um, but quite difficult as well. It took us quite a while to get a handle on it. Uh, I remember the first time he showed it to us was the turning frog, wasn't it? Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, we looked and he thought he saw a turning frog, and then he tried to focus on his head, and he realised you were looking at his butt, and suddenly he would just turn around, and, mm -hmm. and it was quite that was quite a shock mm -hmm. really to discover that your eyes were not telling the truth. Uh, uh, well, I think there's some there were some artists who this is a presenting images in pure color with no variation in light and dark. And there were some artists who did that. It's not Bridget Riley, but... Um, yeah. It's James Terrell. And James Terrell, yes, of course. <laughs> uh, so it's just fascinating to think about what the part of the brain is doing that sees only color and what it's capable of. And now you can go and take a look. That was at um, Self Impressions in 2018 with the University of London. Mm -hmm. Mm. Um, and it was uh, brought together se several researchers and um, departments of psychology as well uh, to explore how we perceive ourselves and see ourselves through a whole lot of different experiments. And our own contribution to that show was a series of helmets called the Meta Perception Helmets, uh, most of which are very well crafted by the craftsman Neil Mackenzie, um, each of which is a sort of an experiment of vision. And one of them uh, was not done by Neil at all. It was a little piece of... As you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, little, a, a very, mm. very, uh, very crudely made bit of DIY, a prototype, mm -hmm. really. Uh, uh, and this was uh, based uh, on, a, on an experiment that Patrick had done mm. a long time back. Go so back what you. we'd like to do is mm. tell you the story of how uh, uh, this, uh, this project, ha which has lasted for a long, long time, because it originated... Um, uh, Back in the 1980s, didn't uh -huh. it? This is this is the paper that Patrick published in uh, in 1991. Uh, in fact, if you look here, it was received in uh, in uh, August 1989. So uh, so about 20 years after that, we first met Patrick. Uh -huh. And um, so it's called Vision with Equiluminant Color Contrasts. Mm. Now that's very very complex title. I don't think mm. anybody you know, ourselves, we don't really understand it. Mm. But what he's talking about really is is motion perception um, uh, in certain lighting conditions, essentially, which we won't really go into. Mm. Mm. But he was very interested, Ke uh, Kevin, uh, sorry, Patrick, in, in, in separating out the components of vision. Mm -hmm. Isn't that right? So that when we met him, in fact, he was, uh, he was interested in the work that we were doing, which was being mm. shown in the Pompidou Centre at the time. Uh, a series of, uh, of um, installations where we separated out uh, um, motion from video, uh, pure colour from video, uh, um, uh, the profiles uh, in video. Mm. Uh, and he was, he, he was very interested because of it, it, it corresponded with a lot of what he'd been mm. doing. And we um, didn't really realise we were doing these um, explorations uh, as aesthetic ideas, mm. we didn't really realize that it was it was you know, you know, represented a long uh, history of exploration into vision at the time at all. But Patrick saw the connection, and he 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 invited us to his lab, and mm. and uh, in two thousand and eleven, uh, and uh, showed us an experiment. Uh, based on his research uh, uh -huh. uh, that he'd been working on for 20 years. Uh, and this, this experiment worked with yellow light and blue filters mm. and the vision of the world that it gave amazed us. So we were, at the time, we were just drawing our, mm. our helmets, our mm. meta-perception helmets, and we drew uh, a version of, um, 
of Patrick's uh, Equiluminance project as a helmet, as uh -huh. a, the Equiluminance helmet. And Patrick was very keen that we do this and said, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, we had actually um, drawn about 25 different types of helmets mm. that you could wear that mm. would explore different uh, scientific aspects of vision. Mm. And, and we ended up building about we, seven uh, or so. Wasn't yeah, it? we yeah. built six yeah. or seven of mm. them. Mm. But we really didn't build this one because it was extremely complicated and we didn't really know how to do it. Mm. In fact, we'd sketched it. Yeah. Yeah, and it involved um, it involved a lot of very subtle work with color and with uh, color filters and with uh, and with electronics. Uh, so it remained uh, on the back burner uh, mm -hmm. for a few years, and finally in two thousand and sixteen. That's right. Bo uh, was a Salambo, Our daughter was fifteen, mm -hmm. and um, uh, she had to do a work experience program. And so we asked, and she's interested in science, when well, she's studying mathematics now, mm. um, and we asked uh, Patrick, uh, could she go into her, his lab to do her two-week experience? And he said, sure. Mm. <laughs> and so... And when she turned up, uh, Patrick said to her, what you're going to do, Salambo, is you're going to build this helmet that your, your parents have drawn. And, uh, and Salambo, uh, uh, Salambo's eyes widened and Patrick said, don't worry, your parents will help you. And so she came <laughs> home and she's, you know, a typical teenager. She said, oh, he wants me to build a helmet. Do I have to? <laughs> <laughs> and we said, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we, 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 uh, we did help her mm. and we worked with a fairly minimal budget uh, and mm. the three of us built, um, built the, the helmet using With a lot of help from mm. Patrick mm. about how to do it. Mm -hmm. Really, you know, the, 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 the actual experiment Mm. setup of how to bring the light up and mm. down and all of that he, mm -hmm. he advised us mm -hmm. and at the end of the summer uh, we had a working version of Patrick's experiment which Patrick tested and was delighted with uh, uh, absolutely yeah. there was a, a conference of conference. on color vision which was uh, which which uh, Patrick was invited to um, and all the main researchers uh, from all the universities of the world working on colour vision were, were there. That's right. Uh, and Patrick Botsalambo, who demonstrated the helmet uh, uh -huh. for all these researchers, uh, all of them were interested. None of them agreed with what it was doing, uh, w mm -hmm. about what it was doing. Um, uh, there, was a, there, was a, there was strong disagreement about exactly what was going on, uh, but they were all interested. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so after that, um, well, uh, Patrick then approached us and said, you know, maybe we could write a paper on it. Mm. And he said, you know, what I'd like is that if Salambo will um, write her experience and then we'll see what we can do with that and see if we get it published. Mm -hmm. And so she did. She wrote, wrote down her experience and then together, you know, Patrick put in more scientific aspects and we contributed parts of it. And Laura Herman, who's another um, one of Patrick's PhD students, also contributed. And together we put together this 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 article that that was was published with with Slambo, who was only mm. sixteen at the time. Uh, and pa Patrick, uh, uh, who who was a prestigious uh, researcher at the end of his career, um, being the generous man that he that he is, um, uh, yeah. off, um, proposed that Salambo's name be put in as the principal yeah. author, and yeah. he, his name be put right at the bottom. Uh -huh. uh, so after a long, long process of peer reviews and rewriting and uh, uh, and rereading and rewriting. Uh, uh, the the paper was published in Eye Perception mm. with uh, with with our sixteen year old daughter as its principal author, and uh, you know that was the generosity of uh, and, mm. and still is the generosity of Patrick Kavanagh. He put his name at, at last on this um, on this paper. Um, that was a really uh, for us a really important experience um, because we'd never collaborated on a scientific paper before. Mm -hmm. neither, neither had Salambo, and what was really interesting was to see the way um, everybody works together, mm. you know, to, to to deliver this thing. And there's such a not a lot of ego involved, which was really a very very impressive experience. Mm. I mean, Patrick very generously um, put Salambo forward, even though she was the youngest person. And um, and then you know we had the whole experience of 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 the rewriting and the peer reviewing and mm -hmm. all of that and, and and so did Salambo, so it was a really big learning experience. You know you learned to the, to appreciate uh, how really challenging it is. Mm. Uh, while we were writing this paper, uh, 
we received a visit from a famous musician. Uh, That's right, uh, um, David Burns. Some of you may know who he is, and well, he's he's a pop star from the eighties and nineties. Mm. So maybe a lot of, of our audience will have never heard of him. Lead singer of Talking Heads. That's right, uh, Talking Heads. Well, how did I get here? <laughs> and so uh, he came to Paris, especially to see. Uh, well, we thought he'd come to see our um, our metal perception helmets, these these metal ones. Mm -hmm. And so we demonstrated these to him. But actually, in actual fact, he was much more interested in the other helmet that we'd made with Bo, mm. the Equiluminance helmet, because he himself had already um, started to develop a project called Theatre of the Mind, and he wanted to work with these these um, uh, perceptual experiences mm. in this. So he was preparing this project in New York on Governor's Island, uh, an extraordinary series of uh, uh, of rooms with uh, each with a with a, an experiment mm -hmm. um, that right. worked with human perception, uh -huh. uh, and he wanted the equiluminance helmet to be part of that. Uh, now so the thing we eventually the equiluminance helmet is it's very difficult to to show in an exhibition situation. Because you know, people have to mm. put it on, and then they've got to, you know, transform the mm. light, modulate the light, and you then they have you, to be. You need, you need someone to help you to explain to you what it's doing to to help yeah. to help uh, to help um, uh, modulate it exactly to where it needs to be. Exactly, and yeah. people, you know, sort of, mm. you don't want people to be, you know, in the dark, bumping into things or whatever. So mm. there's mm. a lot of lot of things to think about. Yeah, and you've got to think about exactly what you're going to be looking at too. You can't just wear yeah. it uh, anywhere. Uh, uh, so it was quite tricky, uh, as yeah. as were all of the experiments that David mm. Burns' Theatre of the Mind yeah. were, was showing. So this uh, is a workshop essentially to try and figure out all those aspects, mm. to try and work out how we could really show this in mm -hmm. in the actual final exhibition. And that, that would have happened in uh, October 2017. That's we were right. In New yeah. York, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, we were when we when we arrived there. We thought we were going to be building a beautiful version of our prototype that was finally finished, uh, and uh, and and as finished as the rest of our metaperception helmets were. And but of course, our aim as artists is that we will make a beautiful thing out of this mm. as well. I mean, the experience is important, but the experience of the spectator looking at the mm. the object and the experience is also as as important as mm -hmm. as as wearing it. Mm -hmm. So we were planning on, on, on something very well finished and very, very well thought out. Uh, as it happened, um, they were very keen on the DIY uh, aspect of the thing uh, being kept. They wanted lots of them. They didn't, they didn't have much time. Uh, uh -huh. So we ended up working kind of in a sweatshop yeah. in New York, didn't we? Um, mm -hmm. To build. Unpaid. <laughs> <laughs> but for the glory of <laughs> art to build and a, science. A, to, uh, making a production line mm. of uh, uh, equiluminous helmets for David uh -huh. Burns' uh, Theatre of the Mind, and then and meanwhile uh, working on the building of the room uh, uh -huh. and the various things, the wheel. So, uh, the so the thing with this helmet is you have to have something moving in a regular fashion. Mm so that you can then judge that, that the movement is changing. Mm -hmm. So ideally, a t turning wheel. So mm -hmm. we had to build a wheel, but it had to be big and rotating. Mm -hmm. And that, the, the, the litmus test of this helmet, if you like, mm -hmm. was that, was that the, the wheel, the turning wheel appeared to stop uh, when you got to uh -huh. Equiluminance. Uh -huh. But we um, thought it'd be interesting if people, we could look at people's movement as well and other things. So we were trying out lots of things. I mean, I mean, I think David Byrne, usually he dresses better than this. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, we, we discovered uh, the stripes were stripes well with are it. Stripes are good, and, uh, yeah. And um, we, we tried probably fairly unsuccessfully to, uh, to, uh, to include um, uh, uh, stripy, stripy clothes in the uh, in, That didn't in the really thing. work yeah. too well. Mm -hmm. We also tried having mannequins turning on displays, on shop Rot displays. Rotating mm -hmm. figures, mm -hmm. mannequins. Then of course when health and safety regulations you know, came in, they, they said no, no, people will trip and fall, so people ended up having to be sitting down. Mm -hmm. So, so really, we were coming up against all these different, you know, constraints about how we can show this mm. or people can experience this as an exhibition, which is mm -hmm. complicated. Mm -hmm. But it was most interesting, and you know, when you put it all together, uh, um, this was a this was practically the most extensive project that we ever did because it began. Uh, with Patrick's mm -hmm. research in the 1980s mm -hmm. in Harvard. Yeah. Uh, it came to Paris with him, uh, where we met him. It became part of our metaperception, metaperceptual helmet series. 
it became it became a student project, uh, our daughter's uh, uh, work placement project. It went uh, it went to a major conference on, uh -huh. on colour vision. Yeah. Uh, it became the object of a scientific paper, which was published in 2017. Uh, it went to New York uh, to become part of David Byrne's Theatre of the Mind. Uh, it went to the Tate Modern uh, to, uh, as part of uh, Self Impressions, uh -huh. uh, yeah. and it's it's still it's still running. You know, as a, we uh, the the project that we're planning the the show that we're doing. So we're going to have a new um, exploration of equiluminance for in the visible light area mm. of of our exhibition invisible thing invisible light mm -hmm. <laughs> but we have visible in there mm -hmm. and we're also going to have um a new demonstration of this at the census festival in biotopia in uh, munich in october mm -hmm. as well so this is ongoing mm -hmm. this this project but and it, it also has a new challenge which is the, co the COVID crisis of yeah. course, because because yeah. we we can't really think about it being a helmet anymore we've got to make a boot um, yeah so you have to build something mm -hmm. so what's really interesting though is that that you know this project has already you know crossed three decades really since Patrick started it and he's still working on it too um, it's it's gone from uh, North America to Europe back to North America to Germany to France to, to, to London. London to uh, it's uh, it's uh, it started with a, a man who's now retired and um, and continued uh, uh, through the through the work of a teenage girl exactly uh, so yeah. it's covered mm. you know three three generations mm. as well so it's it's I mean for us it's a really really interesting example of, of a really good art science collaboration and mm. um, I think I think Patrick has learned things well through us he got to actually get a wearable you know sort of demonstration of his helmet and mm -hmm. now he's using that as well for his further mm -hmm. research so hopefully we contributed mm. to uh, to David Burns uh, career as well how did I get here? So, uh, so that's our experience with visible light. Mm, yeah, um, yeah. Um, um, and uh, that's the end of this talk. Yeah. Uh, we're, um, we'll be back to you tomorrow to talk about uh, infrared. Infrared. Um, so at the same time, so uh, join us tomorrow for, for infrared. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks.